Hi chess fans, we are looking at the game between Bu Xiangzhi with white and Magnus Carlsen with black. The game was played in the World Cup in 2017 and Bu Xiangzhi has actually won the first game and Magnus now has to win with black or otherwise be eliminated. If the game was a draw, Magnus is also out of the tournament. So let's have a look at this game. Knight f3, e6, c4, d5, um, d4. Knight f6, knight c3, c6. Magnus chooses a setup um, with the semi-slav, which allows dynamic chances, but also um, doesn't lead to pieces being exchanged so early in the game. And Bu Xiangzhi plays e3. Um, there are many plans here for uh, white, but this is also a little bit of a small, uh, slower plan. And after knight bd7, Bu Xiangzhi plays queen c2. And um, let's have a quick theory roundup of what um, what is Black's standard plan in this position. So Black's standard plan is to play bishop d6 um, with the idea of preparing to castle and um, building a battery here with the bishop. The bishop is also well positioned here together with the knight to support any of these pawn pushes. And what can white respond to this plan? The most common move is bishop to d3, developing the light squared bishop to the most active square. And for example, after castle, castle, black can now take on c4 and make the bishop take back on c4 and then push the bishop again. So develop the b5 pawn a tempo. If the bishop moves back, black can uh, get a setup with bishop b7 and queen c7 and the game evolves around um, black trying to activate these pieces on the king. Okay, um, similar positions can arise if white develops the bishop to e2. It's just a move transposition in this case. Okay, what are other plans that white can have? So um, maybe it's worth noting that Taking this pawn himself to then maybe develop the bishop to d3 is not good because black can retake with the e-pawn. And black's big problem in the position, the future of the light squared bishop, is solved because it's not blocked by the pawn anymore. So that's why white typically doesn't take with the pawn here. And also um, pushing the pawn forward um, to c5. Um, only helps black because black can just drop the bishop back. This move to c5 hasn't achieved much. For example, after bishop d3, the bishop now goes to the d3 square, cannot be harassed with this d take c idea. Castle, castle, black now simply can play e5, and again, the light square bishop is freed up. Um, this uh, dark square bishop is very strong here on the king, um, and these pawn chains get undermined by the e5 push, and also the bishop. Um, the dark squared bishop for white on c1 is having issues here. Okay, so um, another interesting plan here is the very aggressive g4 with the idea that if knight takes, rook goes to g1, knight takes, the bishop and the knight were attacking this pawn, and then retaking here with the rook. So um, white uh, can choose this very aggressive setup. It's a pawn sacrifice. Um, white is now a pawn down, but on the other hand, he has totally shattered black's king position. And the position is about equal. Um, black can hold, and then white is a pawn down, but um, this is a very aggressive option. Um, and lastly, white can also choose to protect the c4 pawn with the b3 pawn. So now white can play bishop d3, and if black takes, the bishop is not bothered to take with to take on c4, but instead white can retake with the pawn on b3. So after castle, um, bishop to d3, or bishop to e2, depending on what white wants, um, black typically doesn't retake here, but for example chooses a setup with b6, etc. Okay, so all of this is theory, um, but Carlsen chose another plan in this position and leaving the bishop here on f8 for now and playing b6. 
So maybe black didn't like um, all of these positions and um, chooses to develop the to chat to the uh, live squared bishop here to b7 first. Okay, so and this is already where the game leaves standard theory a little bit. So um, very interesting idea. In this very critical game, Carlsen chooses the semi-slav and then the setup with b6. Okay, the game continued. Um, and here Bu Xiangzhi pushed e4. And let's have a look at this position. Um, which operation helps black to neutralize white center and free the light squared bishop here on b7? Okay, Carlson played knight takes, and after the more or less four sequence, knight takes, d takes, queen takes, knight f6, queen c2, c5, undermines white's center, uh, this pawn is also gone, and frees up this bishop. And the point of this variation is that if this pawn moves forward to d5, it would simply get lost. Um, not immediately, maybe, and even if white protects the pawn, um, this pawn is now weak, and sooner or later um, black will win this pawn. So um, that's why d5 doesn't work. And taking here would allow um, black to free up all his pieces, and um, in this position here, this pawn is actually blocking in this bishop. Those two bishops are now very free, and have maximum um, effect on the king side. And whether these two pawns here will become weak is a question of dynamic um, compensation. So, so black has a dynamic compensation for these pawn weaknesses, but right now it's not clear how these pawns can be attacked so quick. Okay, so after this operation, Wu Xiangzhi chose queen a4 and tries to get um, some activity himself against black, who suddenly got this activity with these bishops. So this operation that we've seen is a very good example of how the semi-slav can quickly transition into a very dynamic position. Okay, after queen a4, um, black retreats the knight to d7, and after rook d1, castle, knight e5, knight f6, white tries to get active play himself, and after d takes, b takes, have a look at this position. So we do have these two pawn weaknesses here in compensation for black's activity. And what goals does white have in this position? Okay, white would love to exchange some pieces because if you imagine that, that all of the pieces except the rooks were off the board, then White can take advantage of these pawn weaknesses and simply play against those in an ending. Um, the compensation for these pawn weaknesses is dynamic activity. So as soon as White exchanges pieces, this dynamic activity is gone and White will be better. Okay, so now that we know that White wants to exchange some pieces, how can which, with which move can White achieve this goal? Okay, very interesting. Bu Xiangzhi played knight to d7. And the point is that obviously this knight is now attacking the rook. If the rook simply moves, the problem is that this bishop is hanging. The knight blocks the coordination of the queen with this bishop and after rook takes, black simply loses. Okay, so that's why black has to react to the threat of the rook being attacked. And if black takes with the knight, Rook takes, knight b6, attacking the queen. White can exchange pieces like this and get into a position exactly where you wanted it um, to be. Uh, pieces are exchanged and white can now play against these pawn weaknesses. In a similar way, after queen takes, it's even more straightforward how exchanges happen. In this position, white has even an active rook. Okay, so how to react to this? Carlsen found knight e4 and let's have a look at a tactical calculation exercise. The point is that after knight e4, white could take the rook here on f8. So simply 
and black is leaving the rock alone. But why is this losing for white? Um, try to calculate how black can win here. Okay, the winning move is queen to h4, and the point is that all of these pieces now are active in the king's attack. There's only this um, bishop and the pawns defending the king, and even though black has given up a rook, or the exchange, because let's assume uh, black can regain um, this exchange, um, in return black gets a deadly attack on the king. So after the move queen h4, Black is threatening. Um, black is threatening to take on h2 and mate the king. So, for example, if white doesn't do anything, um, black can give a check, and after king f1, um, deliver the mate on h1. Okay, so that's a threat. And what can white do against this? So, white could, for example play g3, blocking this diagonal of the queen. And the point is that in this position, the knight can sacrifice exchange it itself on g3. And if the h-pawn takes, there's a mate here. And if the f-pawn uh, takes, bishop takes, threatening a mate here. So if white doesn't do anything, the queen goes in. And there is a mate here. So um, if pawn retakes, then the queen simply retakes. And together with the bishop and the queen, black can deliver a mate. OK, so g3 doesn't work because of this forest sequence. What else can white do? White could play h3, um, leaving this diagonal open but blocking the queen to take on h2, but the point is the queen was at the same time also threatening to attack f2 together with the knight. And after check, um, king h1 only move, black now has knight g3. h3 was weakening the g3 square. After king h2, it's mate. Okay, so h3 didn't work, g3 didn't work, and is there anything else that white can do? White could um, take out this bishop with the rook, but then black again has the threat with the queen, and it's mate like this, because um, the rook has left the uh, first rank, and as a result, there is now a back rank mate available. So that doesn't work, and that's it. There's nothing really that white can do. White could maybe try bishop to e3, but now um, the queen simply takes on f2, or rather um, the bishop takes, delivers a check, and um, after king f1, now queen f2 is mate. Okay, so in this position, after knight e4, um, White cannot take because of the deadly mating attack. Okay, so that's why um, this good operation with white, Carlsen found a way out with knight e4, but Bu Xiang just simply con continued by taking this rook, and after takes, um, white has gotten a little step closer to exchanging some pieces. And again, the more pieces are exchanged, the easier it is for white to attack those weaknesses. The game continues bishop to e3, white develops, knight f5, and develops the knight and maybe attacks his bishop. And white now continued rook d1. And white was allowing that the knight takes out this bishop, which was a useful bishop to attack this um, c5 weakness, and also creating this weakness here on e3. And why did white allow this? Well, white allows this because even though he now has this weak pawn here, he gets something for it. And what he gets is that the rook can now, um, the rook controls the d-file and can penetrate into the seventh rank on d7. 
causing a lot of mayhem there and coordinating well with the queen to attack those weaknesses. And the point is that rook d8 doesn't work. And why does rook d8 not work? Little calculation exercise again. Okay, the point is that white can simply take, and if the queen retakes, white has queen takes a7, winning a pawn, but at the same time also attacking the bishop and the pawn. So the rook was simply very necessary to protect the a7 pawn, and if black now tries to win the d5, this pawn simply falls. And the point is that um, if Black tries to deal with these two threats and moves the bishop. The queen simply wins another pawn and the game is lost. And if black tries to move to c7 or to e7 to protect both of these weaknesses, white has um, white has bishop to f3 and the bishop on b7 is pinned against the queen and black will lose a piece. Okay. Um, and that's why after this exchange, um, it's actually better for black to move the queen to a8 and exchange. But in this game, it's a um, lost ending because uh, white is a pawn up and it's an equal colored bishop ending. And um, if anybody plays for a win here, it's white and it's probably very easy to win with white as well. Pawn in games with one pawn up are typically won and this is also a pass pawn. Okay, so um, that's why white was allowing this, and after h6, removing any back rank issues, white can penetrate um, black's position with the rook to d7, exercising pressure on the weaknesses in black's camp. Carlson continued bishop to e4, and white is winning a pawn. And after rook b8, b3, white is now up a pawn. Um, but what is black's compensation? Is black now lost because he's a pawn down? Or why is the position equal? The engine says the position is roughly equal. So where's black's compensation? Okay, let's have a look at a few variations. Um, after queen d8, queen d7, if in this position black was to exchange queens, Black could attack the a2 pawn like this. If white defends, rook d8, king f1, rook d2, attacking this weakness here on a2 again. And white cannot really defend this weakness. So this weakness on a2 can be attacked by both the bishop and the rook, but it can only be defended by one of white's pieces. So as a consequence, white will lose a pawn. And if white plays a4, black can continue to attack rook b2, if now the bishop defends, so that potentially both of these pieces can defend the weakness, then the problem is that um, not only this pawn is weak, but also e3 is weak, and now in this position even g2 is weak. So black is threatening to take out the pawn here on g2. And after g3, the rook can take even the h2 pawn. Okay, so basically, even though... Um, even though... Um, Black is a pawn down. He could draw by getting some pressure on the weaknesses. And um, excuse me to um, to highlight a few other things that we can see from this variation. Black's compensation also consists in the fact that he has the better bishop. So this bishop here on e2 is blocked by his own pawns and then also by, um, by black's pawn. So this bishop doesn't really have any activity right now, while this bishop is having very good activity and, and can attack different weaknesses. Um, another property that gives black compensation is that this c5 pawn here, which is black's weakness, is on a dark square, uh, on a dark square so it cannot be attacked by the light squared bishop so easily. And then, of course, the compensation that we've also seen in the variation is that um, white has the weaknesses on a2 and e3, and as we have seen in the variation, at some point also g2, if the king moves over. Okay, so the game indeed continued queen to d8, activating the queen, and queen d7. So Bu Xiangjia is actually happy to give black this drawn position, because if the game is drawn, 
um, then um, then Carlson would be eliminated and Biu Shangzhi goes to into the next round. So Carlson faces a dilemma here. He wants to keep his chances in the game and not exchange queens. And that's why he chose queen f6 and after rook c7, aiming to exchange some pieces, black played queen uh, a1 and after king f2, king h7, um, making sure these rooks cannot be exchanged and allowing the next move queen f7. Um, the alternative would have been, for example, to play queen f6 and have a check and after king g1 to play rook d8, attacking the queen, but then white can exchange the rooks by force and if this happens, the game is drawn. So Carlsen tried, um, Carlsen tried king, a queen to a1 and king f2, allowing and king h7 to um, make sure the rooks are not exchanged, allowing white taking another pawn. And the last question in this video, um, why did Carlsen do that? Why did he see some chances in this play? And is he not afraid of giving up a second pawn and taking a big risk to lose even? Well, first of all, it doesn't make a difference if the game is drawn or lost. So Carlsen is playing like this because he wants to get maximum chances for a win. And Black's attempt was to play, and this is also what happened in the game, to play queen b2. And the point is that Black is threatening to play bishop to d3, queen a1 lured the king to the f2 square, and in this position here Black is threatening bishop to d3, and at the same time, so if bishop to b3, this um, bishop is pinned against the king, and at the same time the queen protects um, the crucial g7 score, square and the um, bishop protects all the squares around the king. So black's queen and bishop are coordinating nicely in both attacking and defending. But the game continued queen to f4 and after bishop d3 rook takes. And the idea is that after queen takes bishop takes check king g8 the rook is hanging, and um, if uh, king takes, which is what happened in the game, um, queen c7 is not taking the rook, so taking the rook would give black a winning position, but after king takes to play queen c7 check, not to take the rook, and this is also what happened in the game, and now white has a perpetual. If the um, king ever moves down, the queen can take with check, and then come back to the defense of the bishop. So the king can only move up, for example to g6, but then the queen always has checks. And um, if the king moves um, to f4, um, black has queen f4 and if for example the bishop drops back and gives up the threat of the of taking the bishop here white again wins because he will be material up so the bishop has to stay put to maintain the threat of queen takes e2 and um, so if the king moves to um, f6 there's also a perpetual if the king um, should choose to move to g6 and after check somehow move up then white has e4 and um, the bishop now has to take which allows um, the queen to take the rook and again um, the position is now probably equal because white lost another pawn but um, if anybody so, so now material is in favor of white and black doesn't have a mating attack or an attack on the bishop so after queen g6 and queen g3, a draw was agreed. And with the draw, Carlsen was eliminated from the World Cup. And um, I think we can learn a lot from this game. Carlsen chose the um, semi-slav for a needed win with black. And then we saw some interesting operations and also excellent play uh, by Bu Shangzhi to reach the draw. Um, thanks a lot for watching. I hope you learned a lot and see you again next time.